Hello and welcome to another Face to Face. I'm Marzia Hashimi. I appreciate you being with us today. And we're happy to have the uh, Director General of the International Atomic Agency, IAEA, with us um, here today, Mr. Rafael Grossi. Thanks so much for being with us. My pleasure, my pleasure to be here. Um, well, let's start off uh, with, well, tell us about the reason for your trip. Let's start off from there. Well, uh, in, in reality, I would say the relation between the agency and, and, and Iran is a permanent one, it's a continuous process, but in particular, in the case of today, uh, back in September when I uh, made uh, uh, another visit, we agreed, among other things, that apart from a number of technical issues that we were discussing uh, there, we would have soon uh, meetings at a political level to consolidate the um, relations and to discuss uh, a number of issues among the agency and Iran. Of course, here you have a new government, and since the new government took office, I had, I had not had the opportunity to meet with the, with the new authorities, in particular the foreign minister. So that was agreed back then, and, and then, well, it was materialized now. So we've been uh, having a long day of um, discussions, talks, negotiations. And how have the meetings gone today so far? Very constructively, I would say. Uh, we have uh, uh, an important number of issues we, we need to discuss at the technical level, and we have been dealing with those. Now, uh, in the past, there were 13 times that the agency had basically confirmed that Iran was adhering to its uh, commitments under the JCPOA, even after the U.S. Uh, left the agreement. So with this in mind, um, what will the agency's approach uh, towards the anti-JCPOA actions by Washington be? Well, in, uh, what happened, as you enumerated just now, was that there were a number of reports. The United States' previous government uh, took a decision to withdraw uh, from the JCPOA, and, ever, and I Iran took also a number of decisions, uh, reducing its compliance as well. Uh, with, uh, with the agreement, which put us all in a, in a completely different situation as, as in the past. Well, let me just jump in here, because uh, with Iran, we say about Iran, because the United States left the agreement, and, and Iran did not respond right no, away. No, it did not, left the, it did not leave the agreement, mm -hmm. but it reduced and eventually eliminated all obligations in the nuclear chapter After of, two years, of the JCPOA. Right? After yes. two years? Yes, yes. Okay. But it did. Okay. Uh, so the issue is that um, with, with the new government in the United States, as you know, uh, there was a, a reinvigorated uh, process to try to revive, I can put it like this, colloquially, uh, the, the JCPOA. There have been um, a number of rounds of negotiations, another one announced for, for, for very soon. And so as far as the agency is concerned, you know the agency is not a party. To the, to the agreement, but it's the guarantor. It's the verifying institution uh, of the agreement. So, so, so if you're the guarantor of this agreement and the United States withdrew like that, um, uh, was there anything that you could have done uh, to try to prevent them from withdrawing? And also after they withdrew, were there any ramifications for the United States itself? Well, uh, in terms of the commitments by the agency, the agency uh, does not have or did not have a competences in terms of a political decision of a country to remain or to withdraw. Uh, from uh, from the agreement. Uh, so in that regard, what we continued to do was uh, to verify uh, uh, the, the compliance or lack thereof <laughs> of the provisions of the, J the nuclear uh, aspects of the JCPOA. And this is what we continue to do. I mean, but in that process uh, that the United States withdrew, would you admit that obviously Iran has had to pay a major financial price to all of this? Um, uh, obviously because of all the agreements and different things that have happened and then of course the reinstatement of the sanctions. Um, do you think that there should be some ramifications, some repercussions at all by the United States, from the United States for this? Well, the political repercussions of political decisions are not a matter for the head of the, an international organization mm -hmm. to comment on. Uh, what we have is a very, as you know, very specific technical mandate to verify the observance or not of certain 
measures, which in the case of the JCPOA, which is a very detailed agreement, uh, had a number of categories that we had to uh, look uh, uh, into, not what the United States or Germany or France or the UK or Iran uh, had to do. In fact, uh, when Iran took the decisions it took, we never had a political stance on it. We simply continued to do our technical job. You have said before, as I said in the first question, are so that Iran has adhered to the NPT commitments. Um, I, I want to talk about uh, why is the agency uh, has insisted that I Iran goes beyond its commitments. Well, the agency has not insisted on that. It's the JCPOA mm -hmm. that uh, required or foresaw a number of additional transparency and verification measures and the Security Council of the United Nations and the parties to the JCPOA requested, mandated the agency to verify that would be the case. Right, but Iran went beyond its commitments, did it not? It would voluntarily adhere to additional protocol. So my question- As part then, of the JCPOA. So, so my question then would be, why is the agency insistent on that part of it, that Iran adheres to the additional protocol when we have the entity um, like the United States that, that totally left it and many of the aspects, of course, of the JCPOA basically became null and void because the United States left and then Europeans really did not abide by their, their side of the commitments, well, especially uh, from, from financial transactions, we look at that perspective. No, you know, what you mean is that I should be taking political stances, and we don't. Neither for Iran or against Iran or for the United States or against the United States. We simply uh, observe and inform what, what, what is going on. Otherwise, it would be impossible to do our job, as you can understand. So, okay, if that is the case, if the agency doesn't take any political stance, I mean, we look at uh, various measures that has been taken, for example, um, by Israel. We look at the various sabotage measures. We look at the uh, nuclear facility in Kadaj and of course nuclear scientists um, that the Israelis have been responsible for. Um, shouldn't the agency take a stance on that? Or on, on what in particular, on sorry? Basically condemning the situation that causes so much um, terror, basically. If we look at what the Israelis have done to Iran's nuclear facilities, um, if we look at uh, nuclear scientists obviously have also been assassinated, should the agency not condemn that in order to guarantee the integrity of the agency, one, and, and also um, uh, to help those uh, individual states that are committed to this yes. adhere to it. Yes, I would say the following. Um, in terms of violence in general, the agency, myself as head of the agency, and the agency, and any UN affiliated uh, organization, as you can understand, would always condemn uh, violence. We do not conduct investigations or allocate responsibilities, again, on who may have done whatever. What I can tell you, and I have been very clear about this, is that the use of violence is absolutely condemnable, uh, um, with the exception of the cases uh, provided for in the United Nations Charter. One of the main problems that Iran has had with the agency is the confidential information being leaked. Um, can you talk about that? What can the agency do to prevent that from happening? Well, uh, the agency, of course, uh, protects all the information uh, it receives and it has. And if there are people leaking uh, information, the agency has uh, absolutely no capacity to control this, as you can imagine. But I mean, I mean when, when uh, then Iran is giving confidential information, for example, mm -hmm. about nuclear sites, about yes. nuclear scientists, um, uh, and then we see uh, different situations happening. Um, uh, attacks, uh, whether we're talking about cyber attacks or other type of attacks and even assassinations. I mean, do you not think that uh, there should be some type of guarantee when the agency is requesting Iran for this information um, that that information would be protected. The information is always protected, mm -hmm. always protected. So when we talk about leaked information, are you saying that the, uh, that the IAEA, IAEA was not responsible for this leakage? Of course, how could an international organization leak confidential information? How could you think that? 
Well, I mean, if we look at the, uh, what has happened after various situations, various types of information has been given, we see almost uh, sometimes a direct correlation between the information given and various sabotage actions that were taken. Frankly, I don't see that. And in any case, as I say, the information that the uh, agency receives, and it receives um, regularly confidential information, not only on Iran, because we are verifying, as you, as you know, 173 states in the world, thousands of locations around, around the world. So uh, we have a very professional systems of protection of information. Information is distributed to all recipients. And if, if there's one recipient that leaks the information, I don't see how you can uh, indicate that the agency could in any conceivable way be responsible for leakage of information. When we look at uh, uh, Israel, for example, possessing uh, nuclear arms, of course it's not a party to the NPT. It's standing up against a nuke-free Middle East, but um, the agency really doesn't take a stance uh, uh, against Israel. Um, and Israel continually insists to increase pressure upon Iran, who's adhering uh, to its responsibilities. What's your take on that? Do you think it's time for the agency to sh sort of shift its focus uh, on a situation like this when you have an entity um, that is so aggressive um, and anti, actually it seems peaceful, uh, nuclear program, as a matter of fact, that Iran has? Do you not think that the agency should uh, take a different stance regarding this? The agency, as I said, the agency uh, is not taking positions on political positions mm -hmm. of Israel or any other country, and neither should it. What I can say is that we believe that every country should subscribe the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And this is something which is very important. The General Conference of the IAEA has approved several resolutions um, um, insisting that every state in the world adheres to this, to this treaty, which we believe is very important. But and if, if, if they do not adhere to it, for example, an entity like Israel, there are no rep uh, ramifications at all? It's not uh, something that is in the power of the Director General of the IAEA mm -hmm. to uh, inflict repercussions, if this is what you mean, on a country that decides, and, and it's not the only country. Mm -hmm. As you know, there are a handful, unfortunately, right. Uh, very, very few, very few countries that have not subscribed to the NPT. I hope NPT, by the way, is the review conference of the NPT this year, and I am certain that there will be another call for universality of the NPT, which is, which is what we need. Do you not think that the agency has taken a political stance from time to time against Iran? Absolutely not. I mean, when we look at, um, there have been various statements uh, coming from the agency, um, uh, that alludes to, for example, Iran not abiding by uh, certain aspects of their agreement. Um, there seems to be sometimes a sort of prejudicial, uh, a prejudicial um, uh, perspective when dealing with Iran and Iran adhering to its responsibilities. You no, absolu that? absolutely not. I would not agree with that. I would say what we, what we do uh, in our reports, which are very carefully prepared and based on, on technical information, mm -hmm. is when we observe uh, something that uh, is not being done correctly, we simply indicate it. Now, um, the UN General Assembly has recently approved Iran's uh, draft resolution on nuclear disarmament. Is there any will from the agency to actually see this go through, to remove nuclear weapons? Um, because there is a request now coming from the UN itself and has been many times. Uh, your take on this as far as the removal of nuclear weapons well, in general? Well, there's a general principle, and I, I uh, referred to it just now when I was talking about the NPT. Uh, because I think we all want to see a world free from nuclear weapons. That being said, the mandate of the IEA is not a disarmament mandate, it's a non-proliferation mandate. Um, now recently at the uh, summit in Glasgow, uh, you said that nuclear energy is part of the solution to the climate crisis, and of course that's true. We can see that Iran's nuclear industry is being subjected to immense pressure. Does this mean that only certain countries are allowed to have access to nuclear technology? Not at all. According to the NPT, Article 4 of the NPT, 
uh, the peaceful uses of nuclear energy are, is an inalienable right of every country. And uh, the agency uh, has a very, I would say, constructive uh, technical cooperation program, including with the Islamic Republic of Iran. And we hope that this is going to continue and to grow. Uh, what about, uh, do you see any efforts being made by your agency or in the future to uh, try to pressure, for example, uh, Tel Aviv and actually becoming part of this agreement because uh, we know that Israel has nuclear weapons and it, obviously it causes destabilization in the region. Would that be something that uh, would be on the agency's agenda? To put pressure on a country? No, that is not in the, in the agenda. Not even the talking agenda. about, not even bringing up the possibility of a nuclear-free Middle East, for example. We may take part in discussions from time to time on this, but as I said, we do have a mandate and this is what we need, what we need to do. And again, again, because I don't, I'm not shying away from the issue, I believe that the prescription of nuclear weapons is very important, a world free from nuclear weapons is very important, and every country should be part, uh, party to the, uh, to the NPT. As to the IAEA, pre pressuring, to use your verb, pressuring one country or the other to do this or that, I don't think it is appropriate. Is it one of the goals, though, of the agency to have a nuclear-free, nuclear weapon-free world in general? Not as such. Uh -huh. As a general principle, yes, of course. What about nuclear weapons? I mean, that's not a goal to have a world free of nuclear weapons? The IAEA was created to promote the peaceful uses of nuclear energy in all its aspects, and this is what we do. Right, so if it's to promote nuclear energy, so we're talking the peaceful about uses peaceful of nuclear use of nuclear energy. Exactly. And obviously nuclear weapons wouldn't be a part of a peaceful use of nuclear energy. So wouldn't that then be part uh, of the uh, foundation? If you, if you allow me, sure. um, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty recognized five uh, countries uh, which at the time of the entry into force of uh, the, this, this treaty um, had nuclear weapons and were not outlaws for that. We may have our opinions about that. My own country does not have nuclear weapons. Your country does not have nuclear weapons. Uh, so, uh, but we need to make this distinction. In terms of international law, there are countries that were recognized as nuclear weapon states, and they still exist. Um, when we look at the situation with the agency in general, I mean, part of its responsibility, uh, I would think, is actually to uh, enhance the member states in order to reach a certain goal. Um, now, with, with the situation that we see uh, taking place when you have these type of sanctions and putting a block, basically, and stumbling blocks in the way um, of Iran reaching that goal and being able to uh, deal with their nuclear program, peaceful nuclear program, um, what is the responsibility of the agency in this situation? No direct responsibility, but hopefully a constructive role in the sense that uh, if there is uh, an agreement and if uh, JCPOA is revived, the agency, by verifying the observance of the JCPOA, will be part of a situation where uh, this, um, this unsatisfactory situation for Iran may be solved. Uh -huh. So, but there's no way that you're saying that the agency would get directly involved in trying to help. Um, in sanctions, no. It's it's not the role of the IAEA. Not just sanctions. I mean, just actually um, uh, uh, um, helping Iran to abide by its nuclear energy program, being able. We to, do for that. Example. We do that absolutely. Well, I mean, if Iran, for example, because of sanctions and because of, uh, let's say, funds not being able to reach the country and a lot of things that they need to do. Um, um, and we know if we look at, of course, the international yes. media, mainstream media, and, and how it is um, framed uh, as far as Iran not abiding by it, but you, yourself, and also the agency has mm -hmm. said that they are, Iran is. So is there not any mechanism that can be enacted by the agency to help enhance Well, uh, much as you may wish uh, the IAEA to be a party to the solution of the sanctions problem, it is not. This is a political issue that needs to be solved between the United States and Iran, and I hope they will be able to do that. Yeah, but I mean, but this was part of the JCPOA. Yes, um, that, to which the IAEA is not a part. Right, but of course said that... Is the inspector. Is the inspector and trying so... Is the inspector. I just wanted to know, like, if you're in contact with Israelis, if you would try to encourage them to become a party of 
you know, the NPT. As I said, the IEA General Conference has repeatedly, repeatedly approved resolutions uh, exhorting every country, including Israel, to be party of the NPT. Any, any last comments you have? Very pleased to have met you and to discuss all these very important issues. And very nice to meet you, and, and hopefully you. something can be done for the people of Iran, hopefully. Absolutely. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much thank for being much. with us. Thank you. My pleasure. And thank you, viewers, viewers for being with us on another Face to Face right here at Press TV. I'm Marzia Hashimi. Hope to see you right here next time.